I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by Young Harris College, the Richard Russell Library, and the University of Georgia. This is a part of our oral history series on Georgia's First Ladies. And our guest today is Mary Barnes, 80th First Lady of Georgia and wife of former Governor Roy Barnes. Welcome, Marie. Thank you for having me. We're anxious to hear about your life before you became First Lady. Ooh, that was so long ago, I'm not sure <laughs> I remember too much about it. Let's see. Um, I was born in Cher uh, Cobb County, but lived in Cherokee County for the first 10 years of uh, my life. My parents and I lived with my grandmother, um, who was ailing somewhat, and so mother felt she needed to stay there, and which was a fun time for me because my grandmother and I played together. I remember I have a lot of fond memories of that. Um, we lived. Uh, at the edge of a lumber yard, and a lot of my friends were uh, the daughters of people who worked in the lumber yard. And uh, of course, you know, we told all the ghost stories about the different things, panda bears being in the in the uh, lumber yard, and we'd go play in the lumber yard a little bit, and then we'd get scared and run home. And uh, so it was it was a lot of fun growing up in Cherokee County. And then um, my daddy was a highway department engineer, or as we say now, Department of Transportation. And his office was in the old courthouse here in Marietta. So he had a long drive every day from Cherokee County to Cobb County. And we decided that we moved to, it was time to build a house and moved to Cobb County so Daddy wouldn't have such a drive. So we moved down here when I was 10, built a house, um, actually, right behind where we're living now. Um, and he, um, about two months after we moved here, got transferred to Cartersville <laughs> and was made assistant division engineer in the Cartersville office. But he didn't like to stay in an office, so he traveled uh, the roads and traveled looking at jobs and things like that. Um, I, of course, went to Marietta City Schools and uh, Westside Elementary in particular, and then Hickory Hills Elementary, and then back to Westside. Uh, they did a bunch of redistricting during that time. Um, my grandson and granddaughter have uh, applied to go there. They have a, a choice program now where you can choose in Marietta City um, what schools to go to. So I will be hoping that they're going mm -hmm. to go there too, since I went there. Mm -hmm. um, Graduated from Merida High School, went off to uh, Kennesaw for the first two years, Kennesaw Junior College, now it's Kennesaw State University. Um, graduated from there in December and went to the University of Georgia in January of 69. So um, that's where I met Roy on a blind date, which I thought it was a good idea at the time. I wouldn't recommend now <laughs> doing a blind date, but um, we met on a blind date. A, a, some friends of our, mutual friends of ours set us up, and we went to a dance, and the rest is history. We married about a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your mother. She had a very unusual nickname. <laughs> she did. Uh, she was the daughter of the depot agent in Holly Springs. Her name was Elizabeth. But I was 15 before I knew that it was Elizabeth because I had only known her as Spud. Um, when she was a little girl, she was the youngest of uh, the four surviving children that they had. They had six, but they, she was the youngest of four. And um, she loved potato chips and something I unfortunately have inherited. Um, and they were brand new at the time. And there was a store in town that would get a shipment by rail of potato chips. And my grandfather was first in line every day when they came in, because he knew when they came in, to buy her potato chips. And he would buy her every one they had, but the 
uh, manager of the store said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> we have to save a few packages for everybody else. But he, he spoiled her in that way. And he called her spud because he said, you're going to turn into a little spud, which <laughs> of course means potato. And uh, she, she was spud till she died. I, you know, it just stuck. And like I say, I was 15 before I knew she had another name, which was mm -hmm. Elizabeth. So. When did you meet Roy's family? Um, actually, I met them. Um, we met. We started dating in the spring, and I think I met them shortly after we started dating. Mm -hmm. um, we, when you know, when we'd come home from the university on weekends and during the summer, we, you know, would date and go mm -hmm. down there and. Uh, he would come up here. Now, my daddy was um, very particular about who I dated, so he would ask around town. And there was a man that was from Mableton, where Roy was from, named John Lee, who worked at the courthouse. And so daddy went to John Lee and said, I need to know something about this Barnes boy my daughter's dating. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he gave him a glowing report, and that made daddy happy, and it made me happy. And uh, so Daddy was happy with that. Um, Daddy had actually uh, met Roy's father um, during some highway negotiations about building some roads. He had some property that, now this was before Roy and I started dating. He was, uh, they were building the uh, widening Floyd Road mm -hmm. and they were building an, an extension to tie it in to uh, Mabel, Gordon Road at the time, Mapleton Parkway now. And he met his daddy at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he knew him uh, before I knew Roy. He knew Mr. Barnes. Well, tell us a little bit about the Barnes family. Ooh, interesting, curious folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, they uh, ran a hardware store. Uh, there were quite a few. There were quite a few of them too, but two in particular that I remember, and that was Roy's daddy and his uncle Felton, both of whom ran hardware stores right next to each other <laughs> in Mableton, and uh, so that's where everybody went during the time that uh, Roy was growing up. Everybody that campaigned politically came through and campaigned at Barnes Hardware at the at the Barnes stores. And so that's how Roy got interested in politics. Now, the closest I came to politics um, growing up was in my teenage years, I did work on a few campaigns with some friends of ours who mm -hmm. did uh, volunteer work. And um, there was always some cute guys working on campaigns. So <laughs> I kind of volunteered my time too. Um, little did I know that I would be married to a politician and <laughs> and be doing these sort of things uh, all my life after that. But um, Daddy loved, he worked for the highway department, couldn't get involved in campaigns at the time. So um, the only, about the only thing we could do is we would go to the courthouse and listen to returns because back mm -hmm. then, of course, they didn't broadcast the returns. And you got them through going to the courthouse. Um, we would go up there and stay till real late at night, and I loved it. I thought it was really interesting, and the people were all interesting. Little did I know that Roy's dad and Roy were there too at the same time. I never met him, but they were they were there. Uh, one of the other things that I think is kind of interesting when I was in high school um, on. Sunday nights, we would go to a place called Shaw's Barbecue. And it was out on 41, uh, which was the uh, big main road then. Um, and it was the best place to get hot dogs in the, in the whole county at the time. And we would go out there on Sunday nights and eat. And Roy's family would go out there on Sunday nights and eat. Never met then either. And then interestingly enough, we get set up by two friends who are not from Cobb County mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, at the University of Georgia. And then we get married after that. How did he propose? Ooh, gee, I don't remember. <laughs> did he get down on his knees? No, I think we just kind of always knew we were going to get married after a certain time. You know, he it was just kind of, I mean... 
I don't remember that he did anything other than just, you know, can let's set a date and yeah. <laughs> get married. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, Roy's not generally known for his romanticism. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just, you know, we just had so much in common and we, mm -hmm. we were so good um, with each other and knew a lot of the same political people in town at the time. And so. You were married in 1970. Mm -hmm. He was still in law school. Mm -hmm. He had finished a year of law school. He's the same age I am, but he finished undergrad school in three years. And so it took me four to finish undergrad school. And uh, then he went on to law school right after he finished. Did you think in, uh, uh, after your wedding that he would ever be governor of Georgia? I never thought about governor. I knew he was interested in politics and I knew he probably would run for office, but we were thinking maybe you know, councilman, or I am, councilman or mayor or something like that, but never governor. Mm -hmm. Never did that cross my mind. Well, in 1974, at the age of 26, two years out of law school, mm -hmm. he ran for the state senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were you doing then? We had a year-old child. Mm -hmm. um, I was busy trying to learn to be a mother at 20 what, 26, yeah. And uh, he came in and said, I wanna run for the, for the state Senate. And I said, oh, okay, what do I have to do? And he said, well, basically, you know, we'll just go door to door and speak to people and ask them to vote for, it, for me. I said, okay, so I ended up, I, you could have told me I had to cut off my right ear and I think I would have done it. I was so naive to <laughs> political life. Um, and I had this child at home and basically I was good with the hammer so I made all the yard signs and mm -hmm. so I would sit out in in the uh, we had a big room playroom at the time at the house we were living in and I'd sit out there and make yard signs and Harlan would sit on the other side of the room playing with his toys and then you know he'd go take a nap and I'd rest a little while because I uh, couldn't hammer too much with him sleeping. But um, then I would take mother or Ms. Barnes and we would go down the big main roads at the time in his district and I would go to each business and introduce myself and take, cause you took matches and you took fingernail files and you took cards and stuff and they would let you put them and a lot of times they'd let you put a sign up in their windows. Mm -hmm. And so we would leave these things on the counter. So that's what I did during the first campaign uh, didn't have to make any speeches, which was happy, which was made me real happy. Um, and still to this day, I'm not real thrilled about making speeches. I don't feel comfortable doing that. So while he was laboring away at the state capitol, and those of us who know Roy Barnes know knows he labors. <laughs> he's a hard, hard worker, and yeah. he puts everything he has into every job he's he's ever done. Exactly. But those long hours must have left you with some spare time except for raising the kids, what else did you, do, do you well, have any hobby? I know you're a good tennis player. Well, I didn't take up tennis though until the kids were well into school. Um, I didn't start that because I was, I had to be there for all the events in the afternoons late that they had, or um, of course those first few years when they were small, I, it was basically just staying at home. And uh, mother was my only babysitter at that, uh, my father, whom we talked about earlier, passed away a month after Roy and I married. In fact, he was in the hospital in a coma when we married. And um, I don't, uh, I didn't have a lot of babysitters at the time mm -hmm. that could keep the kids, so I couldn't do a lot of stuff with him, and I had to pick and choose what I wanted to do. Um, mother didn't feel comfortable keeping she was a little bit uncomfortable around little kids because she mm -hmm. had a lot of arthritis and she was afraid to pick them up and that sort of thing. And um, so until they got to walking around good and she could hand them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, she really wasn't real thrilled about keeping them. So it was my, that, that was 
that was what I was happy doing, happiest doing, and that's what I did. And I just was there to make sure that their lives were normal and um, that they got the time and got my time uh, as much as they needed. And um, Roy came to as much as he could, but like you say, he was busy long nights down at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he came home every night to us, so. Well, he served 16 years in the mm -hmm. Senate, and then he decided to run for governor. Yeah. Tell us about that decision. Well, uh, we both thought it was the right thing to do. I was happy to have him do that. I told him I didn't like, I would not be giving any political speeches, mm -hmm. which I didn't do. And I, but I did travel a little bit with him. I traveled a little more. In 98, I traveled a lot more than I did in 90 when he ran. Um, we knew all along that with two big names, Elle Miller and Andy Young, it was an uphill battle. But Roy was very well known across the state mm -hmm. because he had been such an effective state senator that um, he, he did have a good showing. I mean, he came in third, obviously, didn't make the runoff, but he, came, he, was, he, he did well, I think. And I think that sort of prepared him for the 98 race. And of course, in case you hadn't noticed, we lose about every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, so he ran in 98 and won and uh -huh. lost in 2002. Well, when, after his uh, uh, running for governor in 1990, he almost immediately ran for the House of Representatives. Uh, yeah, actually, that, that was kind of interesting that this new seat came available. He would not run, he would not have run back for the state Senate because a good friend of ours had run for the state Senate and it had taken his seat when he ran in 90, and he obviously felt that he didn't need to, to try to run against him because he was effective too. So this seat came available and he said, well, you know, I'm gonna run for the House. I've done it in the Senate. And he did it kind of backwards. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people do the House and then the Senate, but yeah. he did the Senate, then the House. Of course, Mr. Speaker, Tom Murphy, told him that, you know, you should have done this first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were, you are now in the best part of the, the, uh, legislature. So the 1998 race for governor was successful. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that race? I remember the long hours and the many campaign stops and, and things we did. I remember uh, going around the state. I made a lot of appearances. I didn't give a lot of speeches, obviously, and but I, I made a lot of appearances on, appearances on his behalf and uh, did a lot of, of parades and met a lot of wonderful people that I still, we still keep in touch with a good many people from across the state. We had somebody call last week and say, you know, we're sitting on ready and we enjoyed reading the article that Bill Shipp had in the paper last week. We hope to, you know, I'm ready when you are. And uh, I'm saying, well, maybe not so fast here. <laughs> yeah. I'm enjoying my grandchildren now. That's good. Well, after you, after one wins the governor's race, they, there's always the inaugural ball. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you had a lot to do with the planning for the inaugural ball. Well, I don't know that I did in, in that we did meet with the event planner and we talked about the, the events and, um, but the staff did a wonderful job of, of taking care. I, I you know, I, uh, I, I really remember being so overwhelmed that I don't, I don't know where, uh, what I was doing half the time there. <laughs> um, and it was so fast, it had to be done so quickly. And uh, it was just, you know, they were, they were beginning to, to put me out doing some things, even though he hadn't been Governor, uh, Governor Miller's wife, Shirley. Uh, was gracious to invite me to go on, with her on a couple of events and um, to kind of get my feet wet. I remember the first one was the mayor's motorcade where the mayors um, across the state um, gather toys and gifts for um, patients at Milledgeville's or at the um, mental hospitals across the state. 
um, but they have a big event down there where they bring the motorcade in and everybody comes out and, and the toys are all brought in and uh, gifts. And then they have uh, um, the Nutcracker. They perform the Nutcracker using some of the patients and it's a very touching, very touching event. Um, and I, I think that was started by Betty Vandiver, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, and carried on by each First Lady since. And she was there, and Shirley Miller was there, and of course I was there. So um, when it got, that was my first little speech or time to say anything. And so I thanked them for letting me come, and I wished them a Merry Christmas from uh, Ms. Mrs. Vandiver from Christmas Past, Mrs. Miller from Christmas Present, and Mrs. Barnes from Christmas Future. Mm -hmm. And so it, they all loved that and thought that was a nice thing to, to do. And I, that was actually the last thing I did uh, was the uh, motorcade. So that was kind of a, a, a touching thing for me. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, Had you thought about what you plan to do as First Lady when you moved into the mansion? Mm -mm, not really. My interest has always been in children. I was a school teacher a couple of years before, while Roy was in law school, and then we started having children and started having campaigns to run, and I started having to spend more time at home. So that meant that I didn't, I wasn't teaching. Of course, I had my children of my own that I, you know, felt strongly about their education. Um, but I had been talking to several people and I had been doing a lot of reading and, and a lot of um, thinking about what I would be doing, um, what I would like to do if I had something like that to do. It mm -hmm. wasn't because I was going to be First Lady, but I was just, I was interested in the fact that 90% of a child's cognitive brain development occurs from birth to three years of age. And all kinds of positive um, reinforcements or positive experiences um, lend themselves to this type of, of development. Um, so I thought it would be good for me to try and focus on the birth to three years of age, which meant that it would be child care, um, it would be um, early, early child care, um, early childhood learning. Um, as a, and they don't have a voice up until that time. I mean, usually it's K through 12 mm -hmm. that, that people focus on. They don't focus on the birth to three years of age. And so I thought that might be something natural that I could um, do in that. And I love babies. I just think, you know, I just could have babies around me 24 hours a day. I just think they're so special and there's so much that you can do with them at, at the young age of even six weeks. Mm -hmm. In fact, our grandson w was born in July and when he turned six weeks old, he was in the swimming pool and he still, he was swimming. Now mm -hmm. you didn't turn him loose obviously, because he didn't understand about breathing and everything, but he had those natural abilities right there, that natural beginning. And he's a little fish in water now because mm -hmm. he's been doing it since he was six weeks old. Mm -hmm. And you think um, you, the children are born with the ability to mimic any uh, sounds they hear. Um, so you teach them a foreign language when they're little. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandchildren watch Dora the Explorer now, and that is a bilingual um, thing. And many of my, I mean, all, the, for, well, I'd say the three that are talking fairly well, because I have two four-year-olds and a three-year-old, a two-year-old and a newborn. And so the, the three and the four-year-olds are mimicking the, are, are speaking some mm -hmm. Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, now, me on the other hand, if you were to try to teach me those words, I have watched every episode and I can't repeat <laughs> any of them. I mean, you know, so it's, it, the, the earlier you start in that field, I think is, is 
so much better for children and gives them such a better start and will make it easier if children uh, have these experiences to close the gap in the future um, when they're in school. Incidentally, uh, is there a protocol for being First Lady? Mm, there's nothing in the transition manual that helps did, you. <laughs> did anyone explain to you what was expected no. of you? <laughs> Not at all. Um, and I think any First Lady can, can do the things she wants to do. Obviously, I had uh, one, I had a daughter in law school. I had a daughter at, um, in getting her undergraduate degree. We still had things to do with them um, that I, in particular, wanted to, to take part in. Alyssa, our youngest, was playing sports over at Sanford, not I mean, she was playing intramural sports, so I would go over occasionally and, and do things with her. I went over and was her mystery reader when she was doing some of her student teaching. Um, and uh, so I, you know, wanted, still wanted to be able to do things with them. So I did not want it to be a full-time job for me. Mm -hmm. I loved hosting events at the mansion. I think the governor's mansion is a wonderful place to sell the state of Georgia to we brought in you know prospective people for businesses we would do the uh, green carpet and the red carpet tours which would bring in financial people as well as people that wanted to were thinking about locating businesses here we would that was one of the stops that they would make on the weekend they were doing it and I enjoyed that I enjoyed having the valedictorians from all across the state come in one day we would set up a big tent we would have speakers we would do uh, refreshments for them we would it was a six hour well it was actually an eight hour day with two hours for us to rest off our feet because mm -hmm. we would stand up for three hours make pictures and then eat lunch and rest for two hours and then do it another three hour period after that mm -hmm. but um, I enjoyed using the governor's mansion to show off the state because mm -hmm. it is a, a state treasure, and uh, I think it's just wonderful that the state has that, and we can, of course, thank the Sanders for that because they were so instrumental in getting that built. And in fact, uh, I I know you've talked to Betty. I don't know if if she told you that she sold some of her paintings to build that fountain mm -hmm. in front of the governor's mansion, mm -hmm. which I think was very generous of her. How did your children adjust to, to having a father who was governor and a mother who was first lady? <laughs> I don't know that they ever really adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would come to some of the events, but they primarily stayed, they were old enough that they could stay away and do their own things. Mm -hmm. uh, because like I say, during that time we had one in college and one in law school. Our son was working full time, so um, it was it was just they were they were gone a lot so it seems that you did not find it difficult to adjust to the first lady role and live a normal life no but then again political families are so open and all of my adult life was spent has been spent in political life um, so what's normal for me may not be normal for most people Mm -hmm. um, and it just seemed normal for us to be doing what we were doing. And uh, the kids, of course, if they called and said, we want to do so-and-so, we want to go out to eat or whatever, we would make it happen somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to all get together for an event, um, you know, come down and swim or do something on a weekend. You know, we would always make it happen. Mm -hmm. But... Um, that was kind of the way it was, though, the whole time that we, all our married life, mm -hmm. um, while Roy was in, I mean, you know, we would, I, they would tell us of events at school and I would put it on Roy's calendar and he'd be there. You know, it was just one of those things where we would make time mm -hmm. for the children and, and uh, he wasn't there as much as he would like to have been. I don't think all of that was politics. I think a lot of it too was just working because he works so much 
uh, as you said earlier, he puts everything he can into everything he does because he thinks that, you know, he obviously loves what he does or he wouldn't put that much time into it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the kids are enjoying us being here and in their lives a little bit more now. Mm -hmm. And especially now that we've moved to Marietta, where they've moved to, the, my three of my five grandchildren can come out their front door and be in our backyard within two minutes. Uh, so it's not a huge problem to uh, see them now. There's a tremendous amount of entertaining that's required of the governor and the first lady. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about some of your uh, activities as an entertainer. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, the mansion staff did a marvelous job of, of putting together the events. Um, basically, thank goodness, all we had to do was show up. <laughs> And um, now we kind of, w I would put my input into, well, I would like to have thus and such, um, or I would like to do this or that. Um, there were a few interesting things that happened. Um, Prince Philip came to spend the night and we, at the governor's mansion. We had the presidential suite, obviously. Um, we had two of his staff members and him spending the night. Um, there were no really nice towels <laughs> at the governor's mansion at that time. So I went and used my own money to buy some nice towels so that, you know, we could uh, have them hanging on the walls. Um, and uh, we were waiting for him to arrive and I realized the staff had left early that day, the, the cleanup, cleaning crew. And uh, I realized that the front porch hadn't been swept off. <laughs> so my son was sent for a broom. <laughs> he was down there then and I said, go get a broom. We're gonna sweep off this front porch. So we're out there sweeping off the front porch before Prince Philip gets there. But he comes in and you know we greet him and he was a very nice, person to be around. Interesting. I noticed that the next morning when he came down for breakfast, he has uh, his tie, his coat unbuttoned, and he's got this big diaper pin as a, a pin to hold his tie in place. <laughs> and it's actually an old-fashioned diaper pin. And I guess that's why it stays in place when he puts his hands behind his back <laughs> like he does, and he's got his coat buttoned, and his tie always stays in place. <laughs> now, Roy's goes from one end to the other, and okay. along with his rumpled hair that he always had problems with. You were an elementary school teacher, mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. So I guess that reflects in the, some of the projects that you undertook while you were first lady. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to know more about your Georgia Early Learning Initiative. Initiative. Well, primarily that was geared toward child care facilities in that um, birth to three years of age um, area that we talked about earlier. Uh, in the childcare facilities in Georgia are, there's not a lot of regulations and not a lot of, I wanted to see them brought up to learning, to, to a learning facility as opposed to just a babysitting facility. And a lot of the, the child cares were just babysitting facilities. Mm -hmm. um, because so much learning can go on between that birth to three years of age, um, we, the standards that we were setting, and I was working with United Way at the time, was um, they, were, they were going to give um, increased pay to um, teachers who went back and got a, a two-year certificate, for instance, a two-year degree, um, as opposed to just having a high school degree, mm -hmm. um, their pay would be increased because they're not paid huge amounts anyway. And there's a huge turnover in, in teaching in childcare facilities. 
we were trying, we were striving toward getting NACI accreditation for as many childhood, uh, many, as many early learning facilities as we could, childhood, child care facilities. Uh, offering um, money for, um, to help parents put their children in child care, uh, low income parents to put their children in child care because it, it gives those parents, um, well, I'm having a senior moment. Mm -hmm. um, cut that out, <laughs> obviously. Um, it gives low income parents who are, who more than likely both parents are working, mm -hmm. maybe even two jobs, uh, a way to have their child given some form of education bef before they enter school. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times children of low income parents are so far behind because they haven't been given positive experiences. I mean, if you've got books and games and toys that are educational in your home because you're a middle income or a, a you know high income family with disposable time and disposable money, your children are going to obviously have a lot more learning experiences. Well, parents who are low income do not. And that was why we were focusing so much on child care facilities so that not that we wanted to uh, the state to run them or anything. We just wanted them to be upgraded to to a learning environment. So mm -hmm. because they're spending eight hours of a day, they are nine times out of ten. and they there's a lot of things that you can do just in feeding lunch that are positive learning experiences um, mm -hmm. talking start talking about nutrition and uh, start talking about numbers counting you know little individual raisins or something like that you know those types of things that you can do with children mm -hmm. that are very important toward their development you're also involved with the wives of other governors in a program to keep Georgia children alcohol free. Exactly. Um, this is something that I think with as many, with in particular now, with as much as we see um, children getting killed in cars from speed a lot of times, but oftentimes there's alcohol involved. And their bodies are still developing, their brains are still developing. You must strive to keep children alcohol free. Um, now that I've, I've noticed a big problem in colleges, there's all these binge drinking parties and stuff. Um, there were parties when we were at the University of Georgia and whatever, and there was alcohol involved then, but it was, Nothing seems like compared to what there is today. And in fact, I uh, have a good friend who had went to a funeral last week of a friend of hers whose child had uh, been binge drinking and passed out and evidently had acid reflux and died mm -hmm. um, as aspirated it back down. And, and that is so sad. Um, so we have to strive to make children aware that this is not something they need to be doing, not only for their health, but for their safety as well. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the reasoning behind that. Uh, you also provided leadership in a program called Safe Kids Georgia. Mm -hmm. That's one of the leading causes of death in children are accidents that can be prevented. Uh, car seats that aren't buckled in correctly. Now, I was a little distressed to hear when uh, we started having grandchildren, of course, that was the first thing I did was went out and bought a car seat. Um, and had to buy two, actually, because we had two a month apart. <laughs> so um, my children went to the fire station to get it checked because that's where we were told to go. And they said, we're sorry, we don't check it anymore. We are not allowed to check them anymore. So I'm, I, I'm a, I was appalled. Um, I think they have a number of a place that they can get them checked. 
but um, if they're not, if if they can't, if people can't go to a place and get them checked regularly, Safe Kids used to provide um, in different areas used to have a day of act, fun activities where they talked about all kinds of things, but they would check car seats as, as well, you know, to make sure they were installed properly. Because if they're not, they're pretty much useless. If they're not installed properly, their child's going to fly out the window anyway. Um, but we, that was, there's so much, um, so many ways children's, children can get hurt uh, and be killed or die from accidental poisonings, accidental, um, a lot of different things. I remember a time when Harlan was little, our son, we were having the house painted. And my fear was that the painters would leave the windows open and that he would fall out the window. Well, it was in the back of the house, it was really far down. So I had cautioned them, if you're gonna paint the windows, leave them cracked, only that, just a little bit. So they did, they were very good at that. Well, I had been so good at teaching Harlan how to brush his teeth that he thought the white paint was toothpaste. And so I, I saw him get his toothbrush and walk out of the room and I thought, now what is he doing? So I followed him in there and he was fixing to put his toothbrush in the paint and put it in his mouth and I thought, this is oil-based paint. This is not something he should be putting in his mouth. And so I run and grab him, you know, before he can do it. But even little things like that, that people don't think about. See, I had not thought about it. And so I was really concerned that um, people become aware of all of these things. And uh, given a opportunity to learn about these things, uh, they, they provided, like I say, um, these fun events that they would teach children how to get out of a burning house or uh, how to um, uh, all different types of things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but primarily, they had this one vehicle that would, um, you, the kids could go in and they would um, put smoke in it and show them how they would become disoriented to, uh, if they didn't have a plan to get out of a burning house or, mm -hmm. you know, and show parents that too. So it all goes back to trying to keep children safe. It was Safe Kids Georgia as a program. Mm -hmm. As First Lady, you were also heavily involved in women's health issues. Mm -hmm. Roy actually created the Office of Women's Health, which the direction that it was meant to take, I think it kind of got off its path, um, was a lot of health issues for women are different than they are for men. For instance, heart attacks present themselves different in women than they do in men. And a lot of times women will go to the emergency room or not even go to the emergency room because they think they may have a sprained back from picking up a grandchild or something like that, when in actuality they're having a heart attack. Um, because their pain presents in the back and not necessarily down the arm, not necessarily in the front of the chest. And so the Office of Women's Health that when we created, or when Roy created it and I wanted to work with it to bring it, to bring to light these different issues, different types of, of uh, the different ways that these same diseases that both men and women have would present themselves differently in women than in men. Uh, let's get back now, if you will, to uh, your husband's term as governor. Mm -hmm. His platform when he won in 1998 was uh, education, education and health care reform, <laughs> which you and I have talked about here. <clears throat> so it sounded, sounds a lot like what your agenda would be if you were running for governor. Well, that won't happen. Just to put that clear, <laughs> make that clear, that won't happen. But 
I think everybody, I mean, you have, education has to be the first priority because you cannot uh, run a state or a nation without its population being educated. Um, jobs will not come to areas where people are not properly educated. This was the biggest focus Roy had was because he feels so strongly about Georgia being the capital of the South, being the, the state of the South that where uh, the engine of the South, so to speak, in that um, jobs will come if, they're, if her people are educated. And there's so much that needs to be done in Georgia. And Roy just had this burning desire that he just had to do it all in one term, <laughs> uh, which may have been a little bit of a problem, but um, education is the key. I know that is such a trite expression, but education is the key to anything anybody does. Um, if you can't read, you can't follow directions, so you don't know how to even fill out a form. Um, so that has to be the main focus of every governor, of every president, of every leader everywhere in order to make, and, and one of the things that we quickly learned was that it's not just a national we're not competing against Alabama and New Jersey and North Carolina and whatever. We're competing against other countries. And in a lot of the other countries, education, the focus on education is much greater than it is here, even though we spend a lot of money on education, but they, the, their, their focus is much stricter, much harder. Um, they go more, in, in Japan, for instance, they go more days a year to school. And so they're, it, it's sort of ingrained in their culture that education is something that has to be done. We take it for granted because we've had it for so long. We've had public education for so long. And I think we take it for granted that it's always going to be there. And uh, you can't legislate what parents do, although that is a big part of what needs to occur when you have education. You need a partnership between the, the education, the state, and the parents, or the counties, the cities, and the parents. You need that coming together that um, a lot of parents do, but a lot of parents don't have time to do. I mean, it's not that they don't want to, but like I said earlier, if they're working two jobs just to make ends meet, then a lot of times they don't have time to put the emphasis on education that they even would like to. But it can be done. It's been proven with different things. Uh, KIPP Academies, which was one thing Roy was really interested in. They, they're, um, they do some absolutely phenomenal things in these KIPP Academies that um, they they have kids coming longer hours in a day. They have kids coming on Saturdays. They have parents that have signed agreements that they're going to make sure they're there every day on time. And everybody can learn, and everybody has the opportunity to learn. And I mean, it's there's some phenomenal things going on in education out there in different areas. It's just putting it all together into one program that's always the hardest. <laughs> In my mind, there are three major contributions that Roy Barnes made to the state of Georgia. One is our new flag. Mm -hmm. Had he not done what he did, we would not have the flag. Mm -hmm. Secondly was his willingness to take on Georgia's transportation mm -hmm. and education problems. And thirdly, his formation of a commission to solve our water problems. Mm -hmm. Now those are what I think were his accomplishments. What do you think were his greatest accomplishments? Well, I agree with you about the flag. I do not believe anybody else could have made that happen. Um, maybe that was his 
intentional, his intention for being there, who knows. Um, I definitely believe that the transportation and the water situation uh, was something that had to be addressed and still needs to be addressed. Obviously with the drought that we've been having, uh, Roy had online something like five reservoirs coming online in the next few years. Um, that all got put on hold and the transportation pro is still a problem. Um, you have to, these are just all parts of a huge net that weaves the state together as, as one viable entity. And unless, there, unless it's done and done quickly, it, 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 well, first of all, it takes a long time to build a reservoir. It takes a long time to build a road. You can plan for it today, but it may be 10 years from now. And by that time, your population has grown and enlarged so that you need to do more. So you have to take on these issues and you have to address them. Otherwise, it just goes undone and the state goes lacking in their resources and in their uh, growth. And what idealistically we would like to do or would like to have seen was that these reservoirs be put all over the state, that, that, these, um, that transportation be carried out into the state so that growth could occur all over the state as opposed to just in the Atlanta area, even though the Atlanta, runs, the Atlanta area runs the rest of the state, but that brings jobs to South Georgia, it brings jobs to North Georgia, it brings jobs to anywhere in Georgia if you've got the infrastructure built and worked on. That's something that every governor has to address um, in order to bring these um, jobs to, to different parts of the state, not just in Atlanta. And Atlanta is so tightly put together with so much that goes on in this area that there's not a whole lot of room for other growth to occur. So it, it's got to be in areas further out from mm -hmm. Atlanta. What did he like to do with the family? Did he play tennis with you? Oh no. <laughs> Roy likes to read. Roy likes, he likes horseback riding. Um, but primarily we just like to get together and have the kids around us, have the grandkids around us now. And we eat together, we watch TV together, we watch movies together, we, watch, we do things like that together. Uh, primarily the movies we watch now are Little Einsteins and <laughs> um, Wiggles. <laughs> and let's see, Dora, Handy Manny. <laughs> um, those things are, are, are our life now, but yeah. that's a great, great time. Well, then came 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, ran for re-election. Mm -hmm. A tough campaign. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that campaign? I remember um, Roy being made a rat, which I guess um, I was just, I, I'm still to this day astounded by that video that was put out showing him a rat stalking Atlanta. Um, I didn't think it was as funny as some people did. Um, and um, but I remember we still had that same group of good friends and good supporters that were still behind us and that would be there tomorrow if he were to decide to run. So we're picking up with negative advertising. 2002. Um, it's, it's awful. It's, I think it's harder on the families than it is on the candidate by all, any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I mean, that video, even though it only aired on the internet, is out there for my grandchildren to see. That is not their father, grandfather. That is not my children's father. That is not Roy Barnes. He did not stalk Atlanta. He did not eat steak while Georgians were losing jobs. He 
was concerned for the state of Georgia from the time he was elected till the time he came home from the governor's mansion, or from the governor's office. And it breaks our hearts to see that. And I'm sure other families that have to live through this, it does the same thing to them. In fact, I was interested to see this past week uh, <clears throat> the letter that the Bush girls wrote the Obama girls was so touching and so absolutely on point about all the, ne not just negative advertising, but negative press in general and how um, hurtful it is to the families. Um, they told the Obama girls to remember that remember their father, that it was not the father they would see in the press. It was not the father they would see drawn in cartoons. It, was not, it would not be the father that they would see um, other people make him out to be. And so that's what we have to focus on in, with negative campaigning. I hate it. I absolutely do not like it in any way, shape, form, or fashion. We try. Now, n there is a difference in negative campaigning and pointing out your issues as opposed to your, uh, your uh, opponent's issues. And that is a way to disagree. And that is what should be pointed out. But when you get down to making somebody a rat, it's that's just totally uncalled for character assassination. It's character assassination in its rawest form and i i personally just think it's very distasteful it has nothing to do with the record mm -mm, or accomplishments mm -mm, because roy has probably had more accomplishments than any governor that i know of in recent history except possibly well i don't know i i i think Roy was a very effective and a very good governor and naturally i would i'm his wife but there again, uh, I saw what went on down there, and I saw how effective he was in getting bills passed and getting things done, and things for the better. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just appalled by some of the character assassinations I see. Uh, to have made, for instance, to have made Max Cleland out as a traitor, I mean, that was character assassination at its worst also. Um, and I was very pleased last week during the inauguration and during the time that uh, the transition at Obama talking about wanting to bring civility back into politics. I mean, the, there's just none of that left anymore. I, I, it's if you're you're unpatriotic if you don't believe the way I do or you're un you know that's not true and it just it it really does make my blood boil so to speak <laughs> with uh, all the negatives that have gone on on both sides now I'm not saying I'm not trying to say that one or the other is worse but um, both sides have created this massive negative attempt. Can you hear my stomach growling? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, can you cut it out? Okay. <laughs> I just knew it was growling and I thought I'm either going to have to get up and eat something or he's going to be able to have to be able to cut it out. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Well, he failed to return to office in 2002, but he remains one of the state's most respected mm -hmm. governors. And he's got plenty of life left. Oh, yeah. Do you think he will ever seek public office again? Well, that's for him to decide. <laughs> I think that's the best way I can answer that. Mm -hmm. So what if he said this to you? Mary, should I run for governor? What would you say? Whatever you want, dear. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you say that? <laughs> Not very. <laughs> but no, it... it I, uh, that, that's something that he has to decide no matter what. We just broke a few minutes ago when we were talking about how the kids were really against him running because they, they have kids of their own now and they see 
him more and mm -hmm. they get the grandkids get to see him more and they want their kids to be around him and to learn from him and everything and and so they're being very selfish in what they do obviously um, they want him here um, sacrifice is something that our family has lived through it's just something that you do if you're the family of a politician for mm -hmm especially one that's a good one, you sacrifice time, you sacrifice a lot being in that situation. But uh, if, I mean, it's something he's got to make up his mind about because if he doesn't feel it, if he doesn't want it, then it'll show, it'll show through. Um, and that I just I, I I would never tell him he couldn't do it, but I'm perfectly happy playing with my little five mm -hmm. grandchildren. <laughs> How did you and he adjust to life after politics? Well, actually, probably pretty good. Uh, he went off and worked in legal in legal aid for about six months. Had the time of his life. He really enjoyed what he was doing. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't continue to do it on the, I mean, he wasn't getting paid. <laughs> so we had to make a living, so we had to come back and make a living. But he, if we could have afforded for him to do that for the rest of his life, he would have been so happy. He got involved in cases that normally a legal aid attorney would never have gotten that involved in. Um, I wish I could give you some examples right off the top of my head. I can't think, you know, of, of uh, I mean, I can think of a few, but uh, there's something, there's just a, uh, there was just an extra sparkle about his, his being because he was doing something that he loved and he, he was able to help people. And that's what he's, enjoyed doing the majority of his life and that's what you do a lot of times in politics is you're able to make things better and lift up people that can't lift themselves up ordinarily on their own. Before we go, let's talk for a minute about the Barnes children. Okay. <laughs> you have a son and two daughters. Mm -hmm. And a daughter-in-law and a son-in-law. Good. Well, tell us about them. Well, Harlan, our oldest child, is a computer Hmm, computer geek, <laughs> for lack of a better word. He would not probably like me saying that. But anyway, he works for a um, company that, I'm not real sure what they do, but he works on their computers. <laughs> and uh, our daughter-in-law, until Will was born, worked full-time in uh, carpet business. She sold commercial, she was a commercial carpet rep. And uh, now they have two children and Will and Libby, and they are just the cutest two little kids I ever saw besides the three other grandchildren that I have. <laughs> then we have a daughter, Allison, who is an attorney, and her husband, John, who is also an attorney. They both work at the Barnes Law Group. We have a daycare, which was one of Roy's big initiatives early on was um, tax breaks for on-site child care. And so he was, he's practicing what he preaches. He b put an on-site child care. We have a nanny and a, she brings her daughter and we have our two girls, soon to be three girls in it. Uh, we did have another lawyer in the firm that had a little boy that was in it. She's no longer with us, but um, it's available for any of the lawyers that have small children that need child care. Um, they're about a block off the square, so the nanny can, we have one of these great big carts that seats six kids, so the nanny can buckle them in and take them up to the square, play in the park, get a special nanny treat when nanny goes along. <laughs> uh, and the kids get to go down and see them. Roy gets to see them every day. Occasionally, the, uh, our son's two children take advantage of it, get to come up there and play. Then our youngest daughter is um, working on her PhD in special ed policy and law. Mm. And she's actually finished her coursework. She's standing her comps this spring. 
And then, much to my chagrin, she's spending 10 months in South Africa starting in August, yeah. uh, working on her dissertation. Um, when apartheid ended there, uh, they mainstreamed everybody. They mainstreamed typically developing, they mainstreamed developmentally disabled children. Um, so she is studying the effects of that versus what we do here in the United States or in Georgia in particular. So that's going to be part of her, that's going to be her dissertation. And uh, she's looking forward to going. She loves Africa. She's been once before and we went with her and uh, spent a couple of weeks. But she's going to be spending 10 months. That's an awful long time for me not to get to see my child. <laughs> so none of them have been bitten by the political bug. No, but if anybody has, it would be her. Mm -hmm. um, she, now that her daddy's not in politics anymore, she doesn't feel obliged to keep her opinions to herself. So she <laughs> has shared quite a few in the newspaper. Um, she wrote one in the red and black about, um, well, we won't get there, but she wrote, she had one in the, published in the red and black, and uh, in, it's, it sort of made its way to the local paper. <laughs> but no, none of them have, have uh, especially the two older ones. Uh, you certainly had a very exciting life, Mary. As you look back over it, is there anything that you would have done or is there anything that you didn't do that you would like to change today? No, not a thing. Um, in fact, when that was the one thing I told the staff when in the governor's office when uh, Roy got elected. I said that I wanted to do as much as I could and still have time with the kids. And I wanted to do as much as I could with Roy because I could, I could contribute a little to his life there. Whereas in the legal profession, I don't contribute that much. And I felt like if I could contribute and do some things there, I wanted to do them because I didn't want to wake up in four years if he didn't get reelected, which he didn't. If I, I, I didn't want to wake up the morning after and say, I wish I'd have done that, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't. And I think that made coming home a lot easier because I think Roy did a great job. I did a fairly decent job. I, I wouldn't say that I was probably, I was not the most effective first lady, but then I did what I wanted to do. And uh, I, I look back with it fondly because it was the most wonderful experience I think I could have had. I think it was a good experience for the children. Even though they didn't get to, they didn't participate in a lot, they still got to do some things that they, that other children wouldn't ordinarily get to do. And um, it's a once in a lifetime thing. But, um, and I tease about the fact that I'm really not the 80th first lady. I'm really the 79th first lady because wasn't it Dick Russell that didn't have a wife he didn't have a wife, but his mother. I know his mother did, his but mother he did. didn't have a wife, That's so right. actually I could be considered the 79th yeah. first lady. No, I'm only kidding. But uh, I, I used to tease Roy that I was the 79th. He was yeah. the 80th governor, but I was the 79th first lady. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and it's just like when the day, uh, one of the days we moved, right after we moved in, of course, Roy and I cut up a lot. That's just something that we do. We, we, are smart aleck back to back and forth to each other sometimes. And one of the things when Shirley Miller had left a box about the furnishings and it had keys to the mansion on it in, in it. So when I found it, I picked them up and I went into Roy and I said, I have the keys to the governor's mansion, so you better be nice to me. <laughs> and Roy was reading the newspaper and he never looked up and he said, but I have the National Guard. <laughs> <laughs> So we kind of left it at that. We didn't, but no, it was it was an interesting time, and we tried to enjoy it as much as we could. And uh, 
I don't regret anything. I uh, have three happy, well-adjusted children and five grandchildren now, and I could not ask for anything better. So well, We've certainly enjoyed having you. Well, I've certainly enjoyed being here. I hope you cut a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank you on behalf of Young Harris College and the Richard Russell Library, the University of Georgia, and myself. Well, good. For being with us. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, the two of the things that I'm most proud of that we did while I was there, um, there was a WSB uh, did a special um, on all the living governors and first ladies at the governor's mansion. They called it the house that Georgia built. And historically, there's so much that went into it. And, and with all the living governors that were there at the time, um, it, it meant so much to have that much history in one place to me, and a, in particular to Roy, because he is a history major. But um, they interviewed each governor and first lady, and then we all sat around the dining room table and talked about life in the governor's mansion. Life, some of the governors at that time had not lived in the present governor's mansion. It was to be, it was talking about building that present mansion. Um, so we talk, they talked about how it came about and all of the work that went into doing it. Then um, the other thing that I'm proudest of was the newborn hearing screening program that we that Roy implemented. I will have to say at my nudging, um, our youngest daughter played basketball with a young girl who was deaf. Uh, they call the plays in sign language. Alyssa learned sign language as a result of it. It's part of how she got into special ed. It's it, and. Her story was that her parents did not realize she was deaf until she was almost two years old. And it goes back to that birth to three years of age. Um, if a child can't hear what you're saying to that child, the child doesn't know how to form words, does not understand commands, does not understand a lot in learning. Now there's a lot you can do. Uh, primarily the biggest thing is the cochlear implant that if you find out a child is profoundly deaf, you can put, that can be put in early on. I think that the FDA has approved it, I know, to 12 months. It may be approved now to nine months. I'm not real sure about that. But the cochlear implant can give them an early start on hearing, and they, by the time they're in school, really don't understand that they didn't hear they are hearing normally like you and I hear. The older they get, the harder it is to transition to because they haven't heard these sounds and what they have perceived as hearing over the years is not the way they, they actually hear. <clears throat> so that was one of the things. Um, I heard story after story after story of parents who did not realize their children were deaf until uh, they were about two years old. Now there is a little bit of a controversy. There are a lot of hearing impaired families that believe that hearing impaired children are not, it's not a handicap and it really isn't because they can perform well in society without it. But it's an opportunity for children who, for, parent, for families to make a decision. But um, that and one other thing that I was doing with uh, early with newborns uh, we were working with Marcha Dimes and Department of Human Resources, primarily public health, to increase metabolic screenings on in newborns. Um, at the time, I think Georgia was only testing for eight mo metabolic disorders, which a lot of times can be uh, treated with just changing the diet of a child. Uh, that will allow them to grow and develop normally as opposed to having a lifelong problem all their life. And some cases it can lead to death. If a child's lactose intolerance, you don't find out about it until two, three months later, that child could die in that amount of time. Um, they were, we were trying to get it uh, 
increase to 30 metabolic disorders. But not only do you, I mean, just testing is a part of it, but there has to be a network set up for parents to learn how to treat these disorders, to learn what to do. And that, so buying the machines, which were expensive, they were about $500,000 a piece, um, was not the hardest part. The hardest part was setting up that network for parents to notify them because a lot of parents would have a child here. Maybe they might be gone into labor from another state and they de delivered at a hospital and their child was tested. Then you've got to follow up with that child. You've got to notify those parents, you know, that that child has this disorder and get them a way of getting some help. So we were working on that. Now, I don't know where that is now. Unfortunately, I've been out of the loop for too long, but it was well on its way to being put into place, and I was real pleased about that. So those were actually three things, not just two, but three things. And in fact, the, going back to the newborn hearing screening, uh, the Miss America that um, was deaf, Heather Whitestone, I believe was her name, um, she came to when we kicked it off at Kennestone, and they were not doing it routine. They were just doing children that, that they thought might be at risk, but they didn't test her children to see if they were hearing impaired. They didn't test her child, but she was pregnant at the time, and she said, this one will be tested because of this program. And so, uh, and of course, all my grandchildren were tested, and they were all fine. And there may not be but one in 500 children born that's deaf, but that's one child that can be given the, the gift of hearing and of learning that might not otherwise, might hold back those other 500 children because of problems that that child incurs from being upset about not being able to hear, not knowing what's going on, not, all kinds of things, disruptions in the classroom that can be caused from that sort of uh, problem. Um, but anyway, those are, those are some of the things that I'm proudest of. Okay?